to Islam and uh, I call this one between isolation and integration because we did a bit of research in Leicester so I'm, I'm going to try not to sort of enter into everything too much but hope that we'll be able to ask lots of questions so the relationship between the convert community on the one hand that's our convert community and heritage Muslims for want of a better word or born Muslims sometimes you know uh, when we did the um, Cambridge um, research we, we refer to them as the heritage Muslim community. So for want of a better term, I'm good. Um, so on the heritage community, on the other hand, and wider society, because we can't really put that aside since this is where uh, the society from which the convert to Islam emerges. So we've got three fronts here, the convert community, the heritage Muslims, and the rest of society. Uh, with regard to their uh, uh, political, social, and religious context, the convert sits very precariously uh, between uh, these, all these polarized states of acceptance and rejection, inclusion and exclusion, integration and isolation. Um, so we have a kind of a lot to deal with on all these uh, fronts. This is the inevitable result of the existence of the contradictory forces and attitudes which the convert to Islam is forced to negotiate. It's a, it is complex, and at times it is utterly chaotic. Um, so we are, you know, we are, you know, on a path uh, to find a spiritual haven for ourselves, but we have to sort of um, navigate with all these these fronts at the same time. And there is something that I call uh, within the uh, the convert experience called rapture and rupture. Okay. So we're caught between this uh, rapture, that's the rapture or the inner delight and, and, and excitement of finding a spiritual path. And this is a, a, a thoroughly, uh, you know, sort of exciting and, and um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lovely experience for people, for converts to Islam who have eventually found this path that they've been looking for. And that path doesn't sort of, you know, we don't just pluck it out of the sky or pull it out of our pockets, you know. It's, it's follow, it's, it, that path is found and it's following prolonged, determined and authentic soul searching through study, reading, conversation and dialogue, exploration and heart-wrenching internal and external pain finally leading to a path of personal spirituality and a relationship with God that has provided a depth of meaning, structure, and the rediscovery and engagement of all the human uh, faculties that have been savagely muted by the triviality of life lived at the edge of everything and at the core of nothing, and having eventually emerged from under the burden of a very materialistic or otherwise, you know, there can be lots of situations um, in the world that has sort of weighed so heavily on our souls and weighs so heavily on the souls of humanity generally. And having gone through that process, we come through, you know, we go through a disti being distilled and, and purified in a sense. Um, and a new day, a new dawn, a new life, as the song go, has begun. Um, and, and, and at last we're feeling good, you know? <laughs> And I'm feeling good. Um, anyway, so that so so that's that's a huge process to have to go through, and that's the rapture of going through that. And I I, I would say that you know I've spoken to uh, converts to Islam and, and who have expressed that the moment or the experience of making their shahada is one of incredible delight and happiness. And I have to say for myself, when I, I remember making my shahada in Dublin about 38 years ago, and I still remember it, I still remember that I thought my chest was going to explode and my heart was going to burst with excitement. I, I wanted to go out and shout it from the rooftops. Um, uh, but then there's the rupture, uh, which is a very painful experience. 
So the rupture, um, I don't know if you've, if, if you've ever bought a, a pack of asparagus and they tell you, you know, when you want to cook them, you just twist them and they snap, just like that. So like the snap of a stick of asparagus uh, that usually, but not always, it doesn't always take place, uh, but it does take place once, uh, generally take place once one spiritual attraction is shared or uncovered by the family, friends, work colleagues, and anyone who you, who you feel remotely close to. And that's the rupture, that's the tear, the tearing apart, the renting asunder of those relationships. Um, uh, and of course, everybody feels that now we've, got, we've, we've joined the rogues gallery of misfits and oddballs, the outsiders whose sense of loyalty and belonging is caught between a rock and a hard place, um, you know, we're, we're traitors to our heritage of birth on the one hand and to our love and affection for our newfound spiritual home on the other. And <laughs> I know that uh, you're kind of looking at me and sort of thinking, is it that bad? <laughs> but I will tell you, I will tell you that when we, uh, when we um, went through the process of this uh, narratives of conversion, uh, female narratives of conversion in Cambridge and we had about 45 women who sat for three weekends and spoke about this um, that was the most painful part of the entire process for them and for many of them who had converted to Islam quite a number of years ago um, that painful process brought back so many memories very painful memories of, of, of situations that had occurred of the fact that we 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 had we had never sort of been able to to discuss this transition with our families in a way that prevented that huge pain from taking place. We didn't have the tools to be able to discuss it with our families in a way that sort of um, it w that it was a gentle kind of breaking of news. It was more like, you know, um, we, they were hit with the subtlety of a sledgehammer. And they responded uh, to that in a way that was very painful. Um, and, and then we, we, we would have gone through, uh, not long ago since, we'd have gone through, you know, the heritage Muslims uh, community uh, referring to them and us. You know, we're, we're us and that's them and non-Muslims out there. And then as converts to Islam, obviously, um, you were sitting there and felt quite alienated from both them and us, because you were from them, but you were trying to become part of us. And it wasn't really uh, a very um, happy or uh, comfortable place to be. Um, you're finding it difficult. Uh, you know, you felt like a pendulum, you know, swinging between the society, family, and social sort of milieu that you came from, and the con the Muslim community that you are trying to enter into, but not having a great deal of of uh, success really on that sense. Um, so the, the the problem is locating a, a peaceful resting place uh, in either, and the, the a lot of anxiety and fear of the unknown was uh, part of that process. And the pain of, of loss is unimaginable, really, when, when it comes to friend, uh, to, comes to family. And as um, Naveed talked about, you know, uh, you know when, when, when somebody passes away and um, the, the family, you see there's always pushback from the family, the, the, your, the convert's family. There's always that pushback all the time. Like, you know, there's always this kind of idea as to when, when will you be coming back? When will you be coming back to us? Because you've gone through this sort of um, crazy phase or this funny kind of time in your life. It's almost like, you know, uh, so when are you coming back to us? Uh, a lot of the things that went, that go on are challenges to your identity. Now, identity is so important to all of us. And the funny thing about it is that the Muslim community talk, always talks about um, cultural sensitivities. You know, oh, I don't think that, that people are understanding cultural sensitivities when they're talking 
to Muslims and to uh, Muslims from different parts of the world? Why can't they understand our cultural sensitivity? However, however, when it comes to understanding cultural sensitivities from the other direction, there really isn't very much. I mean, what about my cultural sensitivities? What about the fact that I'm Irish? What about the fact that I, you know, was was uh, you know I wasn't um, schooled in the gutter or I wasn't uh, brought up with thieves? I was brought up in a good family, a family who had a very strong Catholic faith, Christian faith. I myself had one. Um, you know, what about how, what I wore, how I spoke, how, my language, my uh, my eating habits, all these things. So. This new identity is, um, you know, it was referred to this morning by Professor Mona Siddiqui, this sense of sameness. It's almost like the Muslim community want to get you and they want to put you through a sausage machine, you know, and you come out the other side like all the other sausages, you know. Uh, you're no bigger, no smaller, no, no, no different than anything else in that machine uh, that comes out of that machine. But we are different, and we are, we have our own identity, which has been contributed to by our upbringing, our family, our socialization, our education, our political, you know, sort of adherences, our sexual orientation and choices, and all of these things. And, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, make us all the same. And I think actually this is what is happening with the Muslim community in relation to our children as well as a whole, the fact that we can't accept that our children have, are these multifaceted little beings with multiple identities uh, that are so exciting and so amazing. But we want them to be the same. We want them to go through that little process and come out exactly the same. And I remember it when I was a child, you know, my mum used to say, why can't you be like the Rileys down the road? Why can't you be like this person? Why can't you be like that person? And we do it the same in the Muslim community. Why can't we all be the same? Why can't we all do the right things and do the same things and so on? So identity is, it's like, uh, you know, the old me. And the, a lady spoke to me the other day. She said, you know, I used to love to sing in a choir, but my, my Jordanian husband, you know, he didn't say no to me, but he, he made my life miserable if I wanted to go off to the choir session or when I came home. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I have to say to people, you know, you have to make your own choices. You have to choose yourself what it is you want to do and go out there and do it, uh, rather than going to the local imam. How is he going to respond to somebody who has grown up in this society with these kind of hobbies and so on? And of course he's going to say, Tana, stay at home. So you have to really branch out there and choose for yourself, make your own choices. Uh, uh, then we have, of course, non-Muslim family members, and of course, heritage, a heritage, a, a convert heritage that's not been tapped into at all here in, the, in, in this country. And I think that's not being used in order to, 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 to bring about a sense of Britishness in our Islam. Sometimes I want to say pe to people in the mosque, if you haven't gone up and sort of, you know, felt the sands of Holy Island go through your feet, um, in your bare feet, or you haven't explored the Norfolk Broads in a, in a, in a canal boat, or you haven't gone up to walk, you know, the, the, the um, uh, Hadrian's Wall, or the, um, you know, that, um, what do you call it? <laughs> um, uh, all these places, all these beautiful places in England, then you don't understand the background from which a lot of these converts to Islam have come from. How can you possibly? So, um, I, I, I produced a marriage sermon there a while back ago in order to uh, be able to make it easier for convert, the family of converts to come to a wedding ceremony that said a little more than do you, I do, do you, I do, Fatiha, and it's all over. I just wanted to uh, sort of design something that was much more memorable and much more enjoyable and something that everybody could enter into. And I remember giving it to somebody here in the UK and said to him, so what do you think? And he said, 
He just handed it back to me. <laughs> just dismissed it. He said, oh, it's, it's just too English. And I said, but we're living here. You know, it's, it's English people who are getting married, you know, English people who are converted to Islam. And I brought all sorts of things into it, like the earth, like the exchange of rings. This is a, a, an earth, it's a custom that is, you know, so, you know, heavily entrenched in society. But it doesn't, it doesn't disrespect Islamic understandings or, or sensitivities. Um, so we have to find our feet. And, uh, you know, I, I thought there was such a lovely thing said recently in a, in a film, in that film. It's coming out now, Finding Your Feet. I don't know if you've known. It's coming out next week, I think. It's a lot of all, all our older English um, actors and actresses who's in it. And Joanna Lumley said, um, uh, she was talking, I saw a little trailer, and she said, I've been married five times. You know, my last marriage, she said, um, my divorce was due to religious reasons. And the lady next to her said, really? Religious reasons? Why? And she said, yes, he thought he was God. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you know, marriage is a huge problem for converts to Islam because we have to be more royal than the king, more Muslim than the Muslims, and more of a Muslim wife than any wife that might be, you know, anywhere in the globe. Um, and so I thought it was this fantastic sort of joke when she said he thought he was God. I didn't. So, you know, the demands are so huge. I thought I'd just, uh, to, to end, I just thought I'd read you something. When I talk about uh, the pain that um, uh, sometimes converts go through. So this is just a little, a little kind of a monologue. So I won't stop until I'm finished. It's called The Letter, okay? Mum's 70th birthday was looming and my sister called. We've decided to take Mum out for lunch with the family this year. She's had enough of the greatest mother in the world, mums and all that dust-catching stuff. If you feel like doing anything personally, then go ahead. But nothing collectively this year, just a family lunch. I got the picture. But as the birthday came closer, I felt the urge to do something. Something different. Something of real depth and sincerity. Something of real love. As we were going through mum's things, my sister picked up the letter and she handed it to me. I think you should have this back, she said. I hope you don't mind, I read it. It's a very special letter between you and mum. I just wish I'd had the courage, the inspiration even, to have written something like that. I'm sure it was the best present she ever had from any one of us. When I'd gone home for the birthday bash, sorry, the quiet family birthday lunch with mum. She caught me by the hand when she found an interval in the conversations being held in the family kitchen and led me to the scullery for a quiet moment. What was that big epistle you sent me the other day in the post, she said. I turned to her, my eyes filled with tears. I had to say sorry, mum, to ask for your forgiveness and to thank you for loving me for hanging on to me when no one else wanted to, when it seemed like everyone but you wanted me out of the family. I had to explain, to try after all these years to make it right. You never have to say sorry to me, darling. I love you as I've always done. But it was nice to get it and it was so thoughtful of you to have written it. She squeezed my hand lovingly. Thank you and now we'll say no more about it. Mum didn't look well on her birthday and didn't go to her usual trouble of having her hair done and choosing something special to wear. In the family photographs, she looked weary and forlorn and not with her usual sparkle. She came to visit me a few months later and after she'd had, an, after she'd had an operation for cancer. And when she was leaving, there was something about her goodbyes that made me feel I would never see her back here again. They were thoughtful and sad, as though they were to last forever. She lingered with my husband as though she wanted him to know that her presence would not see out the year, that her caring, her support, and prayers for our little family were coming to an end and were in the process of being terminated. Over the following months, months mum deteriorated. On each visit, she would give me something from her treasured family heirlooms, 
which were scant after a family of 10 had smashed up almost everything over the years. A keepsake, a loving reminder of her presence here, a forget-me-not, as if that were possible. It was on one of these visits, and close to her leaving us, that she asked me to lie next to her frail little body on the bed and chat to her. After lovingly talking about her grandchildren, she suddenly, out of nowhere, and with all the strength left within her, hugged me close, so close I could hardly breathe. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry for what we did to you all these years ago, she whispered. There's no need to be sorry, Mum. I was as much to blame. I was too immersed in my own spiritual journey to appreciate the pain it caused you and Dad. That's why I had to write that letter for your birthday, to let you know that my becoming a Muslim was more about that wonderful start in life that you both gave me, that propelled me to search further and to come closer to God in my own way. Please, Mum, when you meet Dad in your new journey, tell him how sorry I am that we couldn't have resolved our differences before he died, and that I love him and I remember him in my prayers every day. Mum died in the first few days of Ramadan. She and Dad were the best Muslims I know, and they weren't even Muslims. Well, not in the strict sense of that understanding. But I know, in spite of all those Muslims who insist I can't pray for them, and who would prefer I paid no attention or gave no importance to the verse in the Quran, Rabbana irhamhuma kama rabbayani sabira, or Allah, lower the wing of your mercy to them as they did to me when I, when I was a child. And most importantly, God knows, and I leave it with him, and him having 99 parts of mercy that he kept for himself, that I will see you again one day, mom and dad. And I just thought that story, that letter, just gives you some indication of some of the pain that some converts to Islam go through when they have to um, cut ranks with their families or their families cut ranks with them.